I've waited a long time for this. And revenge can be very sweet. I'm not a stupid woman. Now those people are going to be exposed. And it's going to be fun. It's all so peaceful on the other side. Forget troubles, come on, get happy. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Shame on you! Look, what did you do that for? With substance abuse were well documented. The pressures of the Hollywood studio system, coupled with personal issues, led Judy down a path of drug and alcohol abuse. From a young age, Judy was placed on drugs to manage her weight and to help her cope with the demanding schedule of a Hollywood starlet. This early exposure to drugs set the stage for a lifelong battle with addiction, one that she fought bravely but ultimately lost, passing away at age 47 from a barbiturate overdose. In the golden age of Hollywood, where dreams were manufactured and stars were born, one name shone brighter than most. Judy Garland. A name synonymous with talent, charisma, and vulnerability. But behind the dazzling facade of stardom lay a tale of torment, manipulation, and heartbreak. Judy Garland's journey into the spotlight began at the tender age of two and a half, when she first stepped onto the stage of her parents' vaudeville theater. From that moment, her fate seemed sealed. When she walked out on the stage, she had what psychics call a force field around her that was so powerful that it would reach the back of that house. She was just wonderful at everything. She was the all-American gal. I mean, if I was six foot tall, I'd want to marry her. Plucked from the innocence of childhood, she was thrust into the unforgiving world of show business, where her talent would be both her salvation and her curse. Judy Garland's childhood was anything but idyllic. Behind the glitz and glamour of the stage, she endured a childhood marred by neglect, abuse, and exploitation. The Hollywood studio system, hungry for profit, saw in her a malleable commodity to be molded and exploited at will. Under the oppressive thumb of studio executives, Judy Garland was subjected to grueling work schedules, excessive dieting, and the relentless pressure to maintain an image of perfection. She was denied the simple joys of childhood, robbed of her innocence by those who saw her only as a means to an end. Judy was a sensitive soul, trapped in a world that demanded she be anything but. She sought solace in the applause of the crowd, but behind closed doors, she battled demons of self-doubt, insecurity, and addiction. As the years passed, Judy's struggles with mental health and substance comprehend. Welcome back. Hi, my name is Jordan Sparks, and today we are going to be talking about Judy Garland and Judy Garland. Judy Garland is right up there with Marilyn Monroe for me as an absolute legend icon, somebody that I have been in love with my entire life. But also, the more I learn about her and the more that I learn about her story, the more I feel impacted by her still, even though she's been passed for probably, what, 60, 70 years or something like that. And I think that Judy Garland was one of the most gorgeous bright, energetic, enthusiastic lights that has ever graced this world. Her story is absolutely tragic. And to me, it really illustrates like, what is the cost of fame? Because we sit back and we idolize these people and wish that we could have their lives. And I'm sure that Judy Garland had that effect on millions of people, millions of children specifically. And to know that she passed away with nothing is wild. Nothing but a life full of torture and a life full of struggle, be it with personal relationships, career relationships, mental health and addiction. 
This is a really good story, you guys. If you don't know the story of Judy Garland, or even if you do, I'm sure you'll learn something. New information has come forward about Judy Garland. Today, we are going to cover everything Judy. So, here's a warm welcome to a captivating journey through the life of an icon whose brilliance illuminated both the silver screen and hearts of millions. In today's video, we embark on a poignant exploration of the incomparable Judy Garland, a soul whose existence was marked by triumphs that touched the skies and trials that tested the very fabric of her spirit. From the dazzling heights of her meteoric rise in Hollywood's golden era to the challenging valleys that echoed with strains of personal struggles, Judy Garland's life was a symphony of resilience and artistry. Join us as we unravel the threads of extraordinary narrative, weaving through the glimmering moments of success and the shadows of adversity. Through the lens of history, we will witness Judy Garland's indomitable spirit shining on stages and screens, capturing the imagination of audiences across the globe. Yet behind the curtain of fame, we'll also delve into the trials she faced, the poignant struggles that echoed throughout her life it's a haunting melody. So grab a front row seat as we embark on this poignant odyssey, exploring the triumphs and trials that sculpted the legacy of Judy Garland. Together, let's celebrate the life of a star who, even in the face of adversity, continued to sparkle like a diamond in the Hollywood sky. Stay tuned for an emotional roller coaster that will leave you inspired, reflecting on the resilience of a woman whose journey transcends time. Welcome to the Roaring Twenties, a decade that roared with exuberance, innovation, and rebellion. It was a time of unprecedented change, when the echoes of the Great War faded into the background and a new era of modernity dawned. The 1920s was an age of contrasts, where the old collided with the new and tradition clashed with innovation. It was a time of economic prosperity, technological advancement, and cultural upheaval. The decade witnessed an economic boom, with industries flourishing and consumerism reaching unprecedented heights. Factories churned out goods at record speed, and the assembly line revolutionized production, making goods more affordable and accessible to the masses. But amidst the prosperity, the shadow of prohibition loomed large. The nationwide ban on alcohol gave rise to a thriving underground economy, with speakeasies popping up in every corner of the country. Bootleggers smuggled liquor across state lines while police raided illicit establishments in a never-ending game of cat and mouse. The 1920s was also a time of social change, particularly for women. The flapper with her short hair, shorter hemlines, and bold demeanor became a symbol of female empowerment. Women cast off the shackles of Victorian morality and embraced newfound freedoms, entering the workforce, pursuing higher education, and challenging traditional gender roles. Yet, amidst the glitter and the glamour of the Jazz Age, America grappled with deep-seated divisions. The Ku Klux Klan experienced a resurgence, spreading hate and violence against African Americans, immigrants, and anyone deemed, quote, un-American, unquote. But from the crucible of adversity emerged voices of resilience and creativity, as African American artists, writers, and musicians fueled the cultural renaissance known as the Harlem Renaissance. Here's one you all can sing with us when the saints go marching in. In the golden age of Hollywood, where dreams were manufactured and stars were born, one name shone brighter than most. Judy Garland. I was born in a little town called Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I remember once when I was a kid, it was 40 degrees below zero. On June 10th, 1922, Francis Ethel Gum was born to parents Ethel and Frank Gum. Frank Gum was a traveling song and dance man from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. 
When she talked about her dad to me, she, she was a little girl. She was a six-year-old remembering her beloved daddy and talking about him and the wonderful way he could sing and dance. By 1912, Frank Gum was leading audience sing-alongs at theaters in Superior, Wisconsin. His piano player, 19-year-old Ethel Milne. Two years later, they would marry and relocate to Grand Rapids, Minnesota, where Frank operated the local movie house and performed with Ethel as Jack and Virginia Lee, sweet southern singers. Even today, Ethel's energy and passion for music are remembered in Grand Rapids. Before their daughter was born in their hometown of Minnesota, the couple had worried about their financial struggles they would endure if they chose to have their third child. In a desperate attempt, the couple tried everything to induce a miscarriage. The couple's attempts to terminate their pregnancy failed, and Frances was born in New Rapids, Minnesota. After seven years of marriage, Ethel was shocked to learn of Frank's homosexual infidelities, which made her 1921 pregnancy anything but a blessed event. Frank sought help from a friend, medical student Marcus Rabwin. In the middle of the night, the doorbell rang, and he went to it, and there is Frank Gum, white-faced, tension-ridden. And uh, Mark said, what, what's the matter, Frank? And Frank said, well, we've got a real tragedy in our family, Mark. He says, Ethel's pregnant again, and we really can't afford it. We don't want any more children, and I just, I just can't pay the bill. And Mark said, are you asking me to arrange an abortion for your wife? And Frank said, yeah, yes, I am. And Mark said, well, look, don't be silly. He says, you go back to your wife and tell her I said that she must have this baby. I think the one difference was that my family never pushed me into show business. And I think Judy's mother was uh, living out her idea of what she had wanted to be as a singer. And she had the three girls and they were all talented, but Judy by far was the um, most brilliant. Baby Gum was only nine when she met the person who would later teach her to dance down the yellow brick road. Well, she was little, and she had a powerful voice, and uh, she just took over everything. You know, you knew right away when you saw her that there's somebody that's going to go someplace. The child instantly grew, however, to be the family favorite. At age two, the child now nicknamed Baby Gum began to sing and hum tunes and show an increasing talent in music. By the time she was 11, she had been trained by her mother to perform with her two older sisters. They called themselves the Gum Sisters. Over time, they had made a name for themselves and were invited to perform on a short film with their act. They had been advised to change their name from Gum to something a bit more glamorous. Frances, hating being called Baby Gum, started calling herself Judy, and thus Judy Garland was born. Chapter 3, Stage Mommy Dearest, Ethel Gum, A Mother's Vision. Ethel, or Ethel Gum, I don't really actually know how to pronounce her mom's name, was more than just a supportive parent. She was a visionary with an unwavering belief in her daughter's talent and capitalizing potential. Recognizing their potential, Ethel orchestrated countless performances for the Gum Sisters, tirelessly promoting their act across the Midwest. Her dedication and determination laid the foundation for Frances, a.k.a. Judy Garland's future success. And here is where MGM comes in, the MGM Connection. In 1935, fate intervened when the Gum Sisters caught the attention of George Jessel, a renowned entertainment impresario impressed by their talent. Jessel arranged an audition for the sisters with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, one of the most prestigious studios in Hollywood at the time. It was here that Frances Gum's transformation into Judy Garland began. Dear Mr. Gable, I am writing this to you. Ethel's influence, Mommy Dearest, navigating Hollywood. As Frances embarked on her Hollywood journey, Ethel remained a constant presence in her life, providing guidance and support every step of the way. Ethel's keen business acumen and fierce Kris Jenner-type determination ensured that Frances received the opportunities she deserved, navigating the complexities of the entertainment industry with grace and resilience. My heart beats like a hammer, and I stutter and I stammer. 
But Ethel had one goal in mind, securing stardom for Judy as the cash cow for the whole family. It was Ethel's astute negotiation skills and unwavering belief in Judy's talent that ultimately secured her a contract with MGM. Under Ethel's guidance, Francis, now Judy Garland, began her ascent to stardom. You made me love captivating audiences with her mesmerizing voice and magnetic presence. As Judy Garland's star continued to rise, Ethel remained her steadfast champion, a beacon of strength and support in an often unforgiving industry. Her influence extended far beyond the confines of Hollywood, shaping not only Judy's career, but also her identity as an artist and a woman. Oh, but it wasn't your fault. No, I was in the way. But you looked at me. The year 1938 marked a pivotal moment in Judy Garland's career as she stepped into the iconic ruby slippers of Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz, a film that would not only define her legacy but also become a timeless classic in the annals of cinema. At the age of 16, Garland was cast as the lead in MGM's ambitious adaption of L. Frank Baum's beloved novel. However, Judy's journey of Oz was not without its challenges. The film's production was an elaborate undertaking combining live action with groundbreaking technicolor sequences, and it was under the meticulous direction of Victor Fleming that Judy's transformation into the enchanting Dorothy began. The filming process was grueling with long hours and demanding scenes that tested the young actress's stamina. The iconic song, Over the Rainbow, which would later become synonymous with Judy Garland herself, almost didn't make it into the final cut. Studio executives initially considered cutting the song, deeming it too slow and a potential hindrance to the film's pace. However, Judy's emotional and heartfelt rendition of the song ultimately convinced them otherwise, causing her to suffer horrible burns on both her face and hands. Much like poor Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch of the West, the makeup used for the Tin Man was incredibly dangerous. The makeup crew used aluminum powder to make his skin silver, which Buddy Epson reacted violently to. He was hospitalized in critical condition because the aluminum powder had coated his lungs. Jack Haley was recast as the Tin Man, and while he did an excellent job, you can't help but wonder how differently the movie would have ended up if Buddy Epson had played the iconic role. Judy Garland was grossly mistreated by the director. Back in the 1930s, many cruel treatments were considered fair game. Poor Judy Garland, who was only 16 when she was cast to play Dorothy Gale, was treated shockingly by the film's director, Victor Fleming. About its production, Judy Garland was forced to starve herself even though she was at a perfectly healthy weight. Judy faced the pressures of portraying a character beloved by generations, and her personal challenges were exacerbated by the studio's strict control over her image and career. The use of makeup, costumes, and a rigorous filming schedule contributed to the physical toll on the young actress. Despite the hurdles, The Wizard of Oz premiered in August 1939 to critical acclaim. Judy Garland's portrayal of Dorothy earned her a special juvenile Oscar, recognizing her outstanding contribution to the film. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure now of presenting a young, young fellow that you all know that received the Juvenile Award last year. And I know he's probably one of the most popular, well, he is, I think, the biggest box office name in our industry, Mr. Mickey Rooney, ladies and gentlemen. Members of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, it's my privilege this year to present that award for the outstanding performance by a juvenile actress during the past year, Miss Judy Garland. Judy, I, I hope you win many more of them, honey. And The success of the movie catapulted her to international stardom, solidifying her status as a Hollywood icon. Yet the journey to Oz was both a triumph and a trial for Judy Garland. While the film secured her place in cinematic history, it also marked the beginning of the challenges she would face in the industry. Nevertheless, The Wizard of Oz remains a testament to Judy Garland's enduring talent and the magic she brought to the silver screen, capturing the hearts of audiences for generations to come.
Welcome back to our journey through the triumphs and trials of Judy Garland. In this chapter, we delve into the complexities of her relationship with MGM Studio, a relationship that, while fostering her talent, became a double-edged sword. Judy Garland's association with MGM marked a critical juncture in her career. The studio recognized her exceptional talent early on, signing her at the age of only 13. While this partnership propelled her into the limelight, it also laid the foundation for the intricate web of challenges that would characterize her life. The infamous Andy Hardy series, in which Judy starred alongside Mickey Rooney, showcased her versatility as an actress. However, the relentless pace of film production and the scrutiny of her appearance took a toll on Judy's mental health. The studio's expectation of a wholesome girl-next-door image clashed with the complex reality of a young woman navigating the complexities of stardom. The unrelenting gaze of the public and the studio executives scrutinize every aspect of Judy's being, from her weight, steam, but also contributed to the development of unhealthy coping mechanisms. Seeking solace from the mounting pressures, Judy turned to prescription medications, a coping mechanism that would tragically persist throughout her life. This early reliance on drugs became an unfortunate pattern, a desperate attempt to cope with the demands placed upon her by the studio system. Behind the scenes, Judy Garland faced a dichotomy. While her talent flourished under MGM's guidance, the toll on her mental and emotional well-being was profound. The studio system, with its rigid control and often unrealistic expectations, became a crucible that shaped Judy's narrative, contributing to the triumphs and the trials that defined her legacy. Join us as we unravel the intricate threads of Judy Garland's relationship with the studio system. In the glimmering lights of Hollywood, her star ascended, but within the shadows, a struggle for identity and authenticity persisted. This is the story of Judy Garland, the artist, the icon, navigating the tumultuous currents of the studio system in a journey that would leave an indelible mark on the history of cinema. Stay with us as we continue our exploration of Judy's remarkable life, a life shaped by the ebbs and flows of the Hollywood studio system, a chapter that unveils the intricacies of personal life, a canvas painted with both vibrant hues and haunting shadows. Mickey, do you remember the first time you saw Judy Garland? I certainly do. I saw her at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood with her sisters called the Gum Sisters from Des Moines, Iowa. And she sang a song that it's, it stayed with me, Robert, all my life. She sang, Zing with the strings of my heart. It was like a breath of spring. I heard a robin sing about her nest set upon. This little girl singing this song, and I just, I couldn't believe it. Later on, we would go to a place called Lawler's, Ma Lawler's Professional School on Hollywood Boulevard, and all of the studio children would go there. Was there an immediate rapport between you and Judy, though, when you met, and you finally became? Oh, yes, at Ma Lawler's. I told her how much I thought of her when I had seen her at the Pantages Theater, and she says, oh, thanks, Mickey. She was my sister from the beginning, the sister I never had. I'm an only child, Robert. But she was my, she was the love I'd searched for. Gosh, it's a great comfort to have somebody you can tell your troubles to, and well, you're always so wonderful about putting me on the right track. Yeah? Yeah, you know, you're going to make some man a fine wife. Yeah? Yeah. And, well, I'm going to envy the guy that gets you, too. Yeah? Yeah. And, and, Mary, I'll never forget what a great pal you've been to me. Yeah? Yeah, straight from the shoulder, a real pal. Reminds me of a song. What song? 
Oh, what a pal was Mary. Yeah! <laughs> she was born to be one of the greatest performers in the world. She certainly acted her lyrics wonderfully. She, without any equivocation. She, uh, she more than acted her lyrics. I think she's one of the greatest actresses in the world. Oh. Amid the glittering lights of stardom, Judy sought solace and companionship in the arms of love. Judy had begun to venture out and cross paths with handsome composer David Rose, who was 12 years Judy's senior. Despite the protests from the studio and Judy's mother, she became enamored and wooed by the talented Rose and dated him nonetheless. In 1941, they were married. Judy had lived an early life with a tiring schedule and endless pressures from her mother. With her new husband at her side, she believed she had finally found happiness. I think she married too young to get away from everybody telling her what to do. We loved going to her house, and we loved Dave. He's quiet, but he was darling. And she was a charming hostess. In 1942, just a year after her marriage, she found out she was pregnant. Her mother in studio believed that Judy having a child would tarnish her innocent image, one they spent years grooming. Judy, however, was determined to have her way. She made it clear to her mother that she would have the child and thought a baby would add to her happiness. The studio was stubborn, though, and were far more concerned with preserving the virgin girl that audiences adored than they were with her satisfaction. Judy was taken by her mother to an illegal clinic where the child was aborted. It was at that time that Garland was working on her 18th feature film, Meet Me in St. Louis. Garland was hardly excited at her role and found the character and dialogue to be beneath her level of talent. The amount of pressure she was getting didn't help her either. And her director, Vincent Minnelli, realized her need for human decency. He became close to her, working with her and helping her come to terms with her character. Before long, the young actress played her role with the utmost care. Yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be. Uh, tell her 20 things, we'll say, to, 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 to change in the performance, and, and, and God knows she had enough on her mind. But, uh, uh, and, and you didn't know whether you were getting through to her or not. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Caesar. Caesar. Although she was married to Rose, she started to fall for the charismatic and talented director. They soon had an affair, and by 1945, they were married. Her marriage to Vincent Minnelli, the renowned director, brought moments of joy and the birth of her daughter, Liza Minnelli. The union was a dazzling chapter in Judy's life, marked by artistic collaboration and shared dreams. But everything would be perfect. And she would remember everything. She was a fantastic artist. She could do, she knew that there were 20 different ways of playing a scene, you know? And uh, I love working with, it, with that kind of person. However, like any life touched by fame, Judy's personal journey was also punctuated by moments of turmoil. The pressures of stardom and the relentless scrutiny from the public and the studio system placed immense strain on her relationships. Despite the love and happiness, shadows lurked in the corners of her domestic bliss. Judy's friends and co-workers did warn her, however, that Manelli may be homosexual due to his feminine behavior. He leaned less on the side of masculinity when it came to his behavior on set. Anybody that worked with him would say the same thing. He was very nice, don't misunderstand, but he didn't look like the type that would have a girlfriend and marry somebody. People told Judy that Vincent might be gay or bisexual because he was very effeminate. When he first arrived at MGM, he wore makeup. He went on to one set just to observe and he wore makeup, more makeup than most of the actresses. Garland ignored these rules and trials. What? With her spectacular success in The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland became Hollywood's favorite all-American girl. Judy wanted to be glamorous. She wanted to be exotic. She wanted to be everything she was. She didn't want to be the girl next door. That was one of her great problems forever. She saw herself as Lana Turner or wanted to be. And she piled around with beautiful women as if it would rub off. You had the Potter Familia, the big daddy, and these were his children, and he would control them. And he was not necessarily sympathetic or even aware of them in the sense that this was going to hurt them. But the way they used to shoot it, they would shoot just to the point of exhaustion. 
people who ran the business saw a good thing in her and felt that, well, if she's that great, greatest star, we ought to make three pictures a year, four pictures a year. When you start doing that with anybody, even a grown-up, a picture is one of the most devastating things to your whole nervous system. It's a traumatic thing. You're on approval every minute, every shot. You get up at 5 o'clock in the morning for the makeup, and all day long you're under that terrible tension of knowing your lines. Are you making good? After shooting all day long, she'd come home, she wanted to have her dinner, she had to learn a script, she had to take a bath. We all went through that, but with Judy, because she was so high strung and sensitive, she couldn't sleep at night. From what Judy told me in those years, the medication she was taking was a studio doctor, and uh, yes, some of it was for her weight, but a great deal of it was, because these pictures were coming one right after the other for a while, was um, wake her up because they'd given her a pill to sleep. Now they had to give her a pill so she'd be, you know, not groggy in the morning on the set. Metro wanted its 4 foot 11 inch star to maintain a camera thin 95 pounds. Doctors prescribed the miracle appetite suppressant Benzedrine. Judy lost weight and sleep, necessitating the use of barbiturates. They didn't mean to addict her. They were trying to get a picture finished. She did complain to me once that she would love to stop, stop at all, but, but she doesn't know how. She says she can't go tell Mr. Mayor, you won't do it. So that meant you just had to do it in those days. That's what it meant. She knew there was no way that she, she could uh, turn and, you know, refuse this medication. Consistent work schedule and increasing medication made her miserable. In 1943, she submitted herself to psychotherapy in hopes that some relief. It was just a screaming fight. Uh, the, 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 the mother got hysterical, Maya got hysterical. I mean, the idea that MGM movie stars are crazies, that they're lunatics. How can, they, how can I do this? You know, this, a, this girl, all this girl needs is her mother's love, and there is the mother. How can you deny this? And tears are rolling down his face. He must have hated his mother. And uh, the mother is saying, I know exactly what to do with her. You just lock her in a closet. You know, what the girl needs is discipline. And I kept saying, look, the girl needs help. The doctor come and just said, if you'll give me a year, it can straighten out. But the longer you go, the more difficult it's going to be. And there'll come a time when there's no, you know, it's not going to happen. Along with her amphetamines and sleeping pills, she became addicted once more and started showing her new symptoms of erratic behavior due to her high dosages. On the set, which her husband directed, she would have increasing paranoia. She would have to be driven home early due to her inability to keep it together. One of the side effects of amphetamines is paranoia. And when she was on the set of The Pirate, they, were, they had bonfires. They were doing dances around bonfires, and she started screaming, they're trying to kill me. They want to burn me alive, as if she were Joan of Arc being led to the stake. She had, but Judy had to be led away from, uh, from the set, but uh, taken home. She was surrounded by a very intricate spider web of people that were yes people, people that were supposed to be her friends, but I think underneath it all, were they her friends? Because they gave her the, what she wanted, which destroyed her. She would be loving and affectionate. Then when I came home, I could tell, always tell, uh, when she had taken the pills, you know. In 1947, she was sent to the hospital to recover and rehabilitate herself. Later that year, Judy would go on to start an Easter parade, which was a mass success. By 1949, she was offered a role by MGM for Annie in Annie Get Your Gun. This time around, the symptoms of her growing drug addiction got worse and she began to lose her hair. The pills had a cumulative effect and she had to take more and more and more. And eventually, the number of pills she took that she could take safely would have killed a lot of other people. After earning a suspension from MGM, she was sent to a hospital to sober up. Judy Garland returned back to Los Angeles after her recovery completely sober. This should have been a good thing, but the studio had noticed that she had gained a few pounds, a result of her healthy rehabilitation and demanded that she slim down. So Garland went back on pills and threw all of her work out the window. She didn't have anybody that she could really cling to. I think she was the person that had to be guided, and that there was nobody there to guide her. Forget your troubles, come.
Come on, get happy. The Lord is waiting to take your hand. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy. You better chase all your cares away. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy. Your cares fly away. Shout hallelujah, get happy. We're going to the promise. By 1950, Judy Garland had lacked any sense of stability, emotional or physical. She was literally like almost paralyzed. She just couldn't get on stage on time. She couldn't remember her lines. And she would have all these fights with people around her. And I think, I think she was in a living hell. She caused more and more problems in the studio by picking fights and being late to set every day. She earned herself another suspension, which made her have a mental breakdown. The actress's growing need for attention led her to try and slit her throat with a razor. Her husband thankfully found her and took her to the hospital. It was there that they told him it was only a light cut that needed a band-aid and nothing more. It was clear that Garland's cry for help was an urgent one. Judy has always been a, an emotional girl, and I think a lot of it probably was feeling sorry for herself. Just feeling sorry for herself and not being able to do anything about it. She was like somebody drowning. Newspapers, of course, are Judy Garland slashes. It sounded like Jack the Ripper to her. It wasn't. It was really a cry for help. That that was, um, she was a self-abuser in that sense. She wanted attention, desperate for attention. That was how she felt she could get it. She was soon released from her contract with MGM. She decided to move on to radio. She would do performances such as Over the Rainbow to listeners everywhere. Just stay tuned in, folks. This program will be followed by entertainment. <laughs> girl, isn't she, folks? You know, she started out in radio with me. <laughs> we had a lot of fun working for Pepsodent. Pepsodent? You told me we didn't have a sponsor. <laughs> Soon she met her next husband, Sid Luft. A subsequent marriage to Sid Luft, a music promoter and producer, brought its own set of highs and lows. She found out she was pregnant with her second baby and decided to marry the father, Luft, later that year. She believed this was her new chance at being content and welcomed her baby daughter into the world nine months later. When she married Sid Luft, he contributed to her stability. He, he cared very much for her. And uh, I think that he was the best of all of her husbands for her. What Judy needed most was confidence, and that Sid gave to Judy at the beginning. Together, they welcomed children and navigated the complexities of Judy's career. You can really believe that's happening. And your mother was just the age that you are now when she married her. It must make you feel a little odd, doesn't it? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Joe? Have you seen it? Yeah, I could just watch it for a million times. <laughs> I'd never get tired of it and Sid loved was in all of her singing capabilities. He saw an opportunity in her and went on to manage her, which led to her divorce from her husband, Vincent Minnelli. He cultivated her singing career. Sid Luft had, had Judy right like this. He had her heart and soul. He had her trust and her love and respect. And he knew what she needed. By 1952, her singing career was wrapped in gold and she made her career for herself. Happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow. Why, oh, why can't I? As we turn the pages of Judy Garland's extraordinary narrative, the moment when she rose like a phoenix from the ashes of personal struggles and reclaimed the spotlight. In 1954, Judy Garland orchestrated a dazzling comeback with the film A Star Is Born. Her performance as Vicki Lester not only garnered critical acclaim, but also earned her a well-deserved account. Experience the joy and jubilation of Judy Garland as the star. What it's like to see somebody you love crumble away. Selching, selching, selching. Well, she knows somewhere. It was a testament to her resilience, a poignant reminder that her talent, like a radiant beacon, could pierce through the shadows that had lingered for too long. 
The Oscar nomination was a moment of validation, a recognition that Judy Garland's artistry was not confined to the shadows of her past. Her comeback was a triumph, but it was not without its complexities. The echoes of personal struggles still resonated, adding depth to the narrative of a star who had weathered storms and emerged stronger. The joyful moment came to a halt when Judy was informed that her mother had passed away in a parking lot due to a heart attack. She died in the parking lot. And I couldn't understand how that could happen to, to Ethel. She managed everything so well. How could she not have managed her death a little better? The woman who had raised her to be everything she was was now dead. Judy was inconsolable and took more pills in order to quench her tears. The actress had a rocky relationship with her mother due to the abuse she had endured during her childhood days. Despite their disputes, Judy still grieved for her mother. Her addiction became progressively worse and she went to extreme lengths to get her fix. She was becoming the wreck she had worked so hard to get away from. In 1954, despite the actress's shortcomings, her feature film debuted and was said to be the best film of the year. Most audiences adored the film, but when some began to complain about the length, MGM surrendered by cutting a huge chunk from the original cut. This took out key scenes and performances, leaving audiences disappointed and disinterested in the film. Judy was broken. The film was meant to save her from bankruptcy. Post A Star Is Born, Judy's comeback extended beyond the silver screen. Her unparalleled voice, a gift that had captivated audiences since her youth, found a new life on the stage. Concerts became a canvas where she painted emotional landscapes with her performances, each note a testament to her enduring legacy. Television appearances further solidified her status as a living legend. From intimate interviews to show-stopping musical numbers, Judy Garland's presence on the small screen reminded the world that she was more than a star of the yesteryear. She was a force to be reckoned with in the present. Awards and accolades followed, each recognition and affirmation of Judy's lasting impact on the world of entertainment. Yet, as the spotlight once again bothered her in its glow, the shadows of her past remained. A poignant reminder that even in triumph, the journey carried the weight of both joy and sorrow. So it was always at the racetrack and the money was disappearing. Uh, she was desperate for money. Broken with no options, Judy was forced to go back to work after giving birth to her third child. The film studios, however, refused to take her on. She was determined to help her family and went to CBS and made a deal to host their show for $100,000. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first board star jubilee show of the season. And we're presenting Miss Judy Garland in her first television appearance. I can't tell you what I'm feeling. The very mention of your name sends my heart reeling. You know you made me love you. First of all, Miss Garland, a very warm welcome back to London. Thank you very much, Trevor. It's nice to be here. I believe you had a bit of a job landing, didn't you? Well, we, the fog closed in uh, around the airport. It wasn't anyone's fault. We wound up in Manchester, and I've been there before. It's a nice town. And it's last time I'm back in London, and that's important. Now, I Could Go On Singing is your first British film, isn't it? Yes, it is. How do you enjoy working in this country? I enjoy it very much. Very much. I like making films here. I like working here. I like living here. And Dirk Bogart is a very personal friend of yours, as well as your co-star in the film, isn't yes, he? Yes, yes. So this must have been a great help to you. Yes, that was one of the things that I was so disappointed about last night when we couldn't land, because I knew that he was uh, at the airport to, to uh, greet me, and I, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't come out very often to do that. He's, he's, he's tough guy, as a matter of fact, and uh, the fact that he would wait up that long to uh, greet me and uh, that we couldn't touch ground made me sad. Now, on this program a few nights ago, we had an interview with young Gregory Phillips, the British boy who plays your son yes, in the who's film. Yes, who has suddenly become 48 years old since I last saw him. He's grown up, He's hasn't he? enormous. <laughs> when I left, you know, and it, we were doing the picture, he came to my nose and now he's here. Despite the money she brought in from her show appearances, 
she was still in debt, and she became more insecure with herself. Her appearance grew damaging as she gained more and more weight. She eventually found herself on a doctor's bed being diagnosed with acute hepatitis. Her failing liver was the culprit of her sudden weight gain. They made it clear she had to have a surgery to drain the fluid from her body, and if she survived, she would only live for five years, and even then she would never be able to sing again. Nearly killed her. She had ballooned up to an enormous weight. It wasn't that she was just fat, she was bloated. I found out what hospital she was in in New York. And I said, Judy, you're listening to me. This is Mick. I said, I want you to take my hand. We can make it together, you and I. It's like over the rainbow. You and I can make it. Did you hear me, Jutes? The doctors slowly drained some of that fluid from her body and told her that she had no more than if she, if she survived, that she would have no more than uh, five years to live, but that it was certain she would never sing again. By 1961, she started performing at Carnegie Hall with her musical performances, despite the doctor saying she could never sing again. She astounded everyone, and all clapped and even stood upon their chairs with excitement. I know. I'll, I'll sing them all, and we'll stay all night. She won multiple awards and Grammys for her music. She starred in two more feature films, being her best behavior and getting critical praise. In her next film, though, her mood changed swiftly. She was back to being late and causing arguments amongst the cast. But like a true roller coaster, things began to look up for Judy again. She was offered to do her own show, The Judy Garland Show, from the millions of dollars from just the show alone. By the time it was canceled, she was broke. Finally, without a penny in her pocket, she had another mental breakdown and submitted herself into a hospital. Garland checked out of her hospital in debt. Her eldest child, Liza Minnelli, was making a career for herself in music and living on her own. Her two youngest, Joey and Lorna, were living with their father. She proceeded to divorce Sid Love. She went on her own trying to find a way to survive. She was homeless with nowhere to go. I was reading a quote recently and you said, I wish people would stop talking about my comebacks and, and my unhappiness. I have, have had so many happier days. I have so many happy days now. Do you recall saying this? It was just in the paper Yes, recently. well, that's true, you know. I, I've had, uh, maybe it will distress a lot of people, but I've had an awfully nice life. I really have had. I think it will uh, surprise a lot of people <laughs> who kind of like to think of you as a... Tragedy. You know, the poor little rich girl. The, 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 well, the, never the, not, rich, well, just not poor. That, you know, in the same time. <laughs> And the, the woman who had everything and yet, you know, wasn't yeah. happy. What are the things that bring you the... I don't even have to ask you. I was going to say, what are the things that bring you so much happiness today and you're hugging one of them right now? Well, uh, first of all, my two friends here, myself, my oldest daughter, my son-in-law, my future, my past, my present, and my audiences. That ain't bad. <laughs> no, it's not bad. And I count myself among those of your audience who, who love you so much, so I'm doing this interview with great joy for me. Thank you, Barbara. Looking forward to being a grandmother? That's going to happen one of these can't days. Can't wait. Now. Really? I can't wait. I'll let, I want her to have a baby immediately, and then she can see the baby for only 25 minutes, and I'll be a babysitter. Thank I love it. If you hadn't been an actress, if you can imagine being anything else but an actress, what do you think you might want to have wanted to be? Happily married, and um, um, and just a um, nice lady. Do you think it's possible to be an actress and be happily married? Well, I don't think any uh, anybody who married me thought so, but I think it's possible. <laughs> I think it, I don't see any reason, but. I think it's probably a little difficult. It seems that every man I've ever met, they sort of, uh, well, they know that I'm Judy Garland when they start to go with me, and then the minute they uh, 
sort of get entangled with me, they say, do you know how difficult it is to be? Uh, well, why didn't they think of that before they, you know, took me out the first time? I don't know. I don't think I'm that difficult to you. It doesn't seem, it just hasn't been too rough on No. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I would like that. I, I, I'm a good cook, by the way. And I think you can vouch. Yeah. Say yes. <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> fear. <laughs> she makes the best shepherd's pie. Shepherd's pie, they like, yes. That's a pretty good recommendation. Do you want to get married again? You're talking to Joe? I'm talking to you. Really? Joe hasn't been married yet. <laughs> he caught the bridal bouquet at the wedding. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, what do you think you do? Is it something that's... I don't want to rush into it, no. I think I was married the first time when I was six months old, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. No, I've been, uh, I'm not anxious to uh, get married again. I don't see any necessity for that, unless you've got somebody in mind. Gee, I, I don't, don't know, you seem <laughs> awfully nice. I'm going to look around. <laughs> Do you enjoy being recognized? Well, I'm sure there's hardly a place you can go to where you're not. I don't like it too much. I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, it's just a, sometimes a lack of privacy. It's hard to uh, just grow up in the public uh, eye. And I'm a terrible eavesdropper. I, I love to eavesdrop and peek through keyholes. And I've never peeked through one keyhole without finding somebody looking back at me. <laughs> it's terrible. What are you the least tolerant of these days? Uh, the least tolerant? I'm uh, the least tolerant of any more lies or foolishness in print or spoken about me. She had already met and married a young and aspiring actor, Mark Huron, who was able to make her laugh but couldn't keep up with her fits of rage. Only six months after their marriage, they separated and then divorced. Garland again had nowhere to go. She was being fired from sets and trashing her dressing rooms, having one fit after another. She even lost the respect of her fans who were tired of her antics. She would show up late to every show and desperately needed help. She met and married her fifth and last husband, Mickey Deans. In the early morning of June 22, 1969, Mickey Deans knocked on the bathroom door to tell his wife a friend had called. When there was no answer, he said he had felt a terrible feeling deep within and went on the roof to look through the window. Deans spotted Judy, who was cold and still as stone. Deans called the police, who came onto the scene and declared Garland dead. She had died of an accidental overdose, an addiction forced upon her since she was a small child had finally caught up to her. She was the victim of people who wanted more and more from her. Judy gave and gave, not wanting to disappoint the audience, and it eventually killed her. She had no plan to die, but her body was failing. When she did, all were shocked, despite knowing of her addiction. On June 25th, her body was flown to New York City from her memorial where fans stood and mourned over the woman that gave all of herself to them. It was the end of the rainbow.
As we arrive at the final chapter of Judy Garland's mesmerizing journey, we find ourselves in the ethereal realm of her legacy, a legacy that transcends time and echoes through the corridors of Hollywood's history. Judy Garland's impact on the entertainment industry is nothing short of monumental. From the vaudeville stage to the silver screen, from the highs of stardom to the shadows of personal struggles, she has left an indelible mark on the very fabric of Hollywood. Her story is more than a chronicle of fame, it is a testament of the resilience of the human spirit. Her influence extends far beyond her own era, reaching into the hearts and performances of generations of artists who followed in her footsteps. Judy's ability to infuse raw emotion into her work, her unmatched vocal prowess, and her vulnerability on and off the screen have become a source of inspiration for performers across genres, across ages, all across the globe. As we celebrate her triumphs, it is equally crucial to acknowledge the struggles that accompanied Judy's journey, the pressures of fame, the relentless scrutiny, and the shadows of personal battles all played a part in shaping the narrative of a woman who, despite her struggles, continued to enchant the world with her talent. Judy Garland's magnetic presence on the silver screen made her a beloved star of the golden age of cinema. But there have always been whispers and rumors surrounding her tumultuous personal life, especially in relation to her daughter, Liza Minnelli. Growing up on the MGM lot, Liza was surrounded by the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. She watched as stories came to life on the silver screen. But it was not just the allure of the silver screen that captivated her, it was the magic of the stage, the thrill of live performance and the connection with audiences. From the moment she took her first breath, her mother Judy was already a well-established star, and her father, Vincente Minnelli, was a renowned stage and film director whose works were celebrated in Hollywood and beyond. Now, at 77, the enigmatic Liza has decided to break her silence, confirming long-standing speculations and revealing an intimate glimpse into the life and legacy of her legendary mother. From her earliest years, she was immersed in the world of showbiz. Her first taste of the limelight came at age two and a half when she made an appearance in her mother's musical In the Good Old Summertime. Establishing her own identity separate from her mother's was challenging. She was not just an entertainer, she was Judy Garland's daughter. The comparisons were inevitable and expectations were high. Liza and Judy's journey through the entertainment industry was fraught with challenges. Despite their immense talents and success, both mother and daughter faced their share of struggles. Liza, witnessing her mom's struggles, wasn't immune to similar challenges. She became a fixture of the New York City drug-fueled nightclub scene in the 70s. In the early 80s, she made the decision to enter rehab at the Betty Ford Clinic. Both women faced insecurities about their looks as well. They were constantly critiqued and compared to other Hollywood beauties. Judy was labeled as ugly and fat criticisms that deeply affected her self-esteem. Liza faced similar insecurities, often feeling overshadowed by the conventional beauty standards of Hollywood. Arlen's legacy extends beyond her professional accomplishments. Her personal struggles with addiction, her tumultuous relationships, and her battles with the Hollywood studio system have become part of her narrative, offering a cautionary tale about the pitfalls of fame. She's become a symbol of resilience a testament to the human spirit's ability to overcome adversity. Liza, who has often spoken about her mother's impact on her life and career, continues to honor Garland's legacy. Liza Minnelli's reflections on her mother, Judy, provide a deeply personal and poignant perspective on the legendary star. Liza had a front row seat to Judy's life, witnessing her triumphs and struggles, her joys and sorrows. These reflections, shared over the years, offer a unique insight into Judy Garland the woman behind the star, as seen through the eyes of her daughter. One of the most enduring aspects of Liza's reflections is the profound love and admiration she has for Judy. She often speaks of Judy's intelligence, her humor, and her deep love for her children. According to Liza, they always had a great time together because Judy was exceptionally funny, clear, incredibly intelligent, and had immense love for her kids. When questioned about her most cherished aspect of her mother, Liza replied succinctly, everything. Liza also frequently speaks about the inspiration she draws from her mother. Even more than 50 years after Judy's death, Liza still feels her mother's presence and guidance. She shared that whenever she calls on her, Judy is always there for her, and she finds herself reaching out to her mother frequently. She recalls hearing her mother's voice in times of doubt or criticism, 
encouraging her to ignore the negativity and keep going. But she also has her share of pain. She's spoken about the challenges of growing up in her mother's shadow and the difficulty of forging her own identity. She's also shared the struggles of having a famous mother and the pressures that came with it. But despite the challenges, Liza speaks of her mother with a deep sense of respect and love. Perhaps one of the most touching aspects of Liza's reflections on Judy is her desire to protect her mother's legacy. She's been vocal about her disapproval of portrayals of her mother that focus solely on her struggles, insisting there was much more to Judy than her battles with addiction and mental health. Liza emphasized her mother wouldn't disclose such things to her because she was a loving and caring parent. Judy Garland's legacy is a call for compassion and understanding in the face of fame's darker side. It serves as a poignant reminder that behind the dazzling lights of Hollywood, real people navigate the complexities of life, love, and the pursuit of their art. Today, we honor Judy Garland, not just as a star, but as a symbol of strength, resilience, and authenticity. Her legacy prompts us to reflect on the human cost of fame, urging us to approach the stories of our beloved entertainers with empathy and compassion. Join us in commemorating the legacy of Judy Garland, a legacy woven into the very tapestry of Hollywood. As her voice continues to resonate through the ages, may we remember not only the triumphs, but also the trials of a woman who, against all odds, left an enduring mark on the world of entertainment. In the twilight of Judy Garland's illustrious career, a hauntingly poignant moment unfolded, one that encapsulated both the brilliance of her talent and the depths of her emotional turmoil. As she embarked on a recording session intended to chronicle her remarkable life and career for a documentary biography, little did anyone know that it would become a profoundly moving testament to her enduring legacy and the tragic fragility of the human spirit. The atmosphere in the recording studio crackled with anticipation as Garland, adorned with her trademark charisma and vulnerability, poured her heart and soul, but this time not into each note and lyric, but into melancholic, almost, retelling of what really happened in her life. Her voice, once hailed as the epitome of golden era glamour and musical prowess, now resonated with a rawness and poignancy that could only be born from a lifetime of triumphs and tribulations. Beneath the surface, laid a sense of sadness, a haunting echo of the personal struggles that had plagued her throughout her life. The weight of her experiences, from the pressures of child stardom to the relentless scrutiny of fame, bore heavily on her shoulders, infusing each and every word with a bittersweet melancholy that left a palpable ache in the hearts of all who listened. As the recording session unfolded, Garland's voice quivered with emotion, weaving a tapestry of longing, despair, and fleeting emotions of joy, honestly, offering but a glimpse into the depths of a soul tormented by the demons of fame, addiction, and unfulfilled dreams. Now, uh, well, uh, for openers, I don't know how to work this machine. I'm just astounded at this machine. This is the silliest way I've ever known of spending the nights alone talking to yourself into an obvious Nazi machine. This is a red China Manchurian candidate machine because I can't get anything on tape. And when I do record anything, I automatically erase it and I'm sitting in a room all by myself, ho, ho, boy. And across the room on my library shelf are about 35 tapes of shows that I've done for CBS. Hmm. 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 Now, in those boxes that hold the tapes, my life depends on those. And yet, I don't know how to work. That's not my business. I was trying to be a singer. I don't know how to read notes. I can't read music. And I don't, I can't count too well. And I don't know how to work this machine. But that's the story of my life. You go with it even if you don't know what's going on. Keep talking, singing, smiling, and taping. Somebody tell me that this, uh, 
might be interesting. But I've gotten so involved with this Donovan's brain machine, tape machine. It should be Johnson and Johnson's tapes. My wounds I'd like to tape. But I just am trying to get a few thoughts done, and I'm all by myself, uh, as usual, and trying to go straight with myself. Now, that makes you feel kind of dumb. <laughs> you can't, I can't, have, can't find my glasses to read the directions. I don't know what 33 and a third means. That just means out of sync to me. And uh, then they got all kinds of kind of early <laughs> Franz Joseph directions that uh, I'm not equipped for. I have done, believe me, I have done two, what do they call it, spools of tape, of talking. I think I erased the whole thing and just Peggy Lee and myself came on in a rehearsal tape that played backwards. I wonder if Sid Luft's mother makes these machines. Could be. She made all those machines. She made Sid. She spawned him in the the uh, Red Sea somewhere, I think. But to, um, yeah, let's just think about my trying to be heard. Do you realize how many people have talked about me, written about me, imitated me, told my children that they really know me? They know Judy Garland. My little girl, Liza, came home one day from school. She was about 10 years old, and she said, what is this? She has a lovely kind of Italian indignation, that, uh, indignity, I should say. <laughs> yeah, see, I can't read, write, or talk too well. Uh, but it's all in the machine. Uh, maybe Madison Avenue puts out these machines. Yeah. Webster and Madison. At any rate, Liza came home from school one day and said, uh, what, what is this nonsense that I always hear at school that everybody knows you, Judy Garland? Everybody knows Judy, but yeah, but they really know her. No, they really know her. They knew her when she lived in Transylvania. They had the house next door, and they heard all the the uh, insanity of of the. Uh, Mama. And Liza looked at me and simply said, Look, I don't know you, Mama. And nobody ever will. I never will. <laughs> That's my girl. Well, we know each other pretty well. I'm rather proud of that. So far, I think I'm on a blank tape. I don't know. I just played that last... A uh, bit of tape that I tried to do. It, something came out that sounded okay, I guess. I think it was me. Uh, I can so always uh, truthfully say that nobody asked me. Nobody asked me. I was too little when I went into the vaudeville. I was two years old and I just knew Jingle Bells and my grandmother threw me on to my father's stage. He owned the theater in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And I just sang Jingle Bells and nobody told me to stop, so nobody ever asked me. Now, I've never bothered to answer because the questions have never been quite clear. But I can sit here now at a nifty age of 41 and honestly say there's just me and this machine, baby. <laughs> and I don't know whether anybody's interested in that, but I am. I worked very hard, and there's all the success and failure and fatigue and overweight and thinness and tears and laughter and 
Halloween and no... Oh, well, really. It's like something out of Tess of the Stone Country. Uh, I cannot take myself seriously because if I did, I would have died a long time ago. And I don't want to die. I've never met a cast of people I want to die with. You go on an airplane, look around at people reading the Reader's Digest or whatever. You don't want to die with them. First place you get... I get top billing. Judy Garland dies in plane crash for other uh, deceased. Turn to section B, page 18. And then they take them alphabet. And they're a peculiar bunch. What are we doing flying around in airplanes, for one thing? We, we're not... Even the birds don't go up that high. We just don't belong. We have to buckle ourselves in and hope. And there's no hope and no oxygen. Now, we don't belong up there. Now, you know we don't belong up there. At least that I don't uh, understand. I have to make friends with the pilot and uh, give his children my autograph. Whereupon he tells me that uh, his children are just as important to him as my life. Forget it. I'm, his life isn't nearly as important as my life is to me. Sheer selfishness. I don't really care about anybody but me. <laughs> and when my number is up, I want a new one, and I have no intention of checking out. Now, this machine isn't going to get me either. One way or another, we're going to overcome it. <laughs> I'll say. See? There have been people like spooks that go in and out of my life. I don't think many of them are terribly interesting. But I have many, many interesting, good, solid, talented, lovely people that I can... that have taught me the meaning of laughing, being able to laugh at oneself. I am funny. I attract, well, inanimate objects just uh, uh, ruin me. I can check into a hotel to do a one-night stand concert and try to go into the closet to get my dress off a hanger and an absolutely strange, strange, mind you, little wire hanger without one thing on it flies off from left field and hits me right in the nose. A lot of people hit me in the nose. i got a kind of nice nose. Hmm. I keep breathing. My antrums. Hmm. They get a little stuffy now and then, but by goodness sake, keep breathing in and out. I have a rather good intellect. I have a good sense of humor, but it's high time to cut the comedy and high time to stop the trolley ride because I, Judy Garland, I'm going to talk. And everybody just better sit on the bench and watch the ball game. Put the pattern straight. I'm outraged. I'm outraged about many things that I've read about myself, that people have said. They've affected me deeply. Now I'm going to talk back. I'm going to talk in my own words and tell the truth. So here goes. And if I sound like the lady does protest too much, don't get the idea that by telling my story, and I have a right to, don't think that comes from anything but having been treated and treated badly written about in a shocking manner, smeared, scandalized, and I'm sick of it. I've come to a time in my life when I don't want it anymore, and I can't rise above it. I can't rise above the scandalous, obscene lies that have been the so-called printed word and I can't rise above the gossip mongers that have... Well, all of it is 
affected my children, my health, and my work. By writing the truth, perhaps the effects will not be so painful to my family and to me. First of all, I don't understand. I don't honestly understand why I've been the victim and been made the victim of so many untruths. Perhaps you don't understand what it's like to pick up a paper and read things about yourself that are true. Read loathsome things that have nothing to do with your life or you or your heart or your beliefs or your kindnesses or your willingness. I've spent years and years and years trying to please through singing or acting. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet, I've constantly been written or talked about by certain individuals that I'll get to later as an unfit person. Well, what kind of people are they? What kind of business are they in? They're dead people. But they've tried to kill me along the way, and by God, they won't. They won't. Because I'm mad. I'm a very lucky woman in some ways. I'm a very lucky woman to have come to this time of my life and found happiness with a fine man. A fine man. A man who is able to love me. Not just that I'm able to love, but the fact that he loves me. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that Mark Heron loves me. Just me. Whether I sing or dance or whether I don't. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm very proud. It's made me prettier than ever. That's what my my oldest daughter, Eliza, tells me. I'm prettier than ever. Eliza has grown up to be a strong, beautiful, talented, fine, fine, sensitive, courageous young woman. I'm proud of that. I did that alone. I raised that little girl alone because nobody cared about us. Nobody cared. Oh, they cared about the money that I brought in because they made it made them rich. Lots of people got rich off of me. My children didn't get rich. I didn't get rich, and Mark Heron didn't get rich. But we have a love. My little boy, Joe. My little girl, Lorna. My young lady, grown-up daughter, Liza. Mark myself. We have a love that makes everything else look just stupid. Sid Luft is an animal. He's just some kind of breed. And I'll tell the world whenever I can that he's a thief A blackmailer, a sadist, and a man who doesn't even care one 
bit, one way or the other, about any other living soul, let alone his nice children. He's never contributed one penny to their upbringing. He's never contributed one hour to their peace of mind. He's told them how untalented they are, how stupid they are, who needs them. He's told them how he doesn't like them. That's a nice man. That's a big, upstanding tramp. Well, maybe he's in with the judges in Santa Monica court so that I can't even get to see my children now that I live in England. Because I can't live with the stench of the Santa Monica courts and the stench of Sid Luft and the stench of lawyers who rob me and just keep it going, keep the case going. Judy's crazy. Judy doesn't know what she do. I know well enough how to raise three kids and damn well. And I know how to be loved by a man who understands the pressures I've had to go through. And it's worth it. It's worth it. And the hell with all the crazy fan mail, so-called fan mail. The letters get saying, you've sinned, Judy. Turn to cry. I go to church every Sunday. I've got God in my heart. That's more than most of you can say. My children have it. Mark Heron has it. And we present an army. We represent strength and goodness. And by God, justice had better prevail. Although I doubt it. Being Judy Garland is quite a chore. Not only for me, but for Mark, for Joe, for Lorna, and Liza. But it's not too much of a chore for Sid Luft. And it wasn't too much of a chore for Vincent Minnelli to just overlook the fact that he had a magnificent daughter. Being Judy Garland, sure, I've been loved by the public. I can't take the public home with me. And I've been ripped to pieces, ripped to pieces by the public and the critics and the newspapers and people who don't know what they're talking about. And I demand, I demand to be heard. I will be heard and I'll keep talking for the rest of my life because now I can talk. Now I'm happy. Now I know that there is no gaslight in my life and the people who try to present it are the criminals. And it all comes down to the unholy dollar. Well, I'll always be able to make money, but I'll keep it. I'll keep it for my children, myself, and I won't pay $25,000 a year to a bum, to Sid Luft, who's a bum, a tramp. And so is his mother, and so is his sister, his whole rotten background. And I'm not afraid. People who say they should hold marriages together are, my God. God, my God, what happens to the children if you expose them to a to a a mongrel? He wants money. He's not able able to to do anything mentally, and he's a paranoid. 
but physically he's capable. Let him get his fanny out and go to work. I'm not paying for him anymore. I'm not paying for anybody who tries to rob me. Not rob. I'll pay. I'll pay. Just the way everybody else has to pay. Money. If you buy something, you pay money. If you owe a bill, you pay it. I'm a very honest woman. Nobody's ever encouraged me to talk before. It's a little difficult to sit and talk about yourself. I'm a very modest woman. I've always believed in that terrible cliché. Uh, whatever is printed in the paper today is yesterday's news. That's a lot of nonsense. I get mail and fi, fi on the rotten poison pen letters. The people who write those are demented. I'm going to live a life that is as splendid as my surroundings are. My men and my children. I'll get my children. I support my children. I've brought them up and I love them and they love me. I respect them. I worship them. They give me the same respect the same love in return. They're brave children. They have to be. Look who their father is. What's he ever contributed? What's he ever done? What's he ever done for the world? He and his friends. I wish they would all get lost. How can they use two fine children and put a price on both those children's heads so the children can come and be with their mother. It's not that I'm wailing like a an old-fashioned mother. I need them. I need them as much as they need me. I need their laughter. I need their arms around me until they grow up and it's time for them to go about their own lives. I want to be fair, but I want them with me. I gave birth to them. I supported them. I loved them. I, I still do. But for goodness sakes, for God's sakes, what about the lawyers? What about the judges? What, they're being handed over to a man. If I can, I hate that word in connection with Sid Love. Michael Sidney Love is not a man. He's not a father. He's not a worker. He's not a contributor. He's not anything. He's a pimp. There is no community property. He drew up an agreement before he married me, saying there was no community property because he didn't want to support his ex-wife's son, his son and his ex-wife. I won't give him a cent. I won't give him the time of day, but I wish to God somebody would come to my aid. The judges sit down. I don't know how he pays them off. Sitting, my children are stuck in Santa Monica. They didn't even get to visit me on school vacation. Because I'm supposed to be an unfit mother, I've been working my head off. Somebody had to feed my children, and that was me. And it was my pleasure because they, in return they gave me laughter, love, comfort, beauty. But it was damned hard to keep from climbing up the wall with frustration. So I'm not going to be frustrated anymore. 
I'm going to talk. And somebody's going to print this. Even if I have to put up the money myself. I'll print it in a little book. Maybe somebody will read it. And maybe somebody will learn a little bit of the, of the truth of this so-called legend. I, that's why I'm supposed to be a legend. Judy Garland, all right, then read about it. Read the truth, though. I want to love. I want to be friendly. I want to work. Don't get in my way. And don't let other people get in my way. Get off my back. Let my loved ones stay around me. Let me stay around them. Let me live, for God's sake, let me live. To start with, if anyone's going to print anything about me, write anything about me, it'll be me. I'll print about me. I'll write about me because I'm the only one who knows. And I just refuse to stay silent anymore. While everyone else makes news about me, so-called news, it's very untrue news. And I'll never again be made the target to some demented, sick mind that just wants to print bad things, the hell with the good things, and there have been a lot of good things. I'll never be that kind of target again. There's no more over the rainbow for me. I've grown up, and those days are over. There's nothing about me to threaten by exposure. I've been exposed since I was a little girl. Wrongly exposed. News was made. Bad news. I know exactly who did it, how it was done, why it was done. I'm not a stupid woman. Now those people are going to be exposed and it's going to be fun. I've waited a long time for this and revenge can be very sweet when it is proper and right. I'm a very revengeful person now. I don't want any more lies printed about me. My children read the newspapers. They have to put up with their schoolmates and what their mates say about me. They do the best they can. They don't pay any attention to it. They've learned better. And they're smarter. But I don't want somebody who is retarded writing columns or saying things like... <coughs> Like Miss Hedda Hopper or Miss Luella Parsons, who seem they seem to be terribly important. I don't want them to say, poor, poor Judy, right after I've triumphed at the Palladium in London. Write something good about me. I've been nice to them. I've been polite. You ought to see the condition they're in. Oh, boy. I know their makeup man. I know the tricks they have to do to pull those women's faces up so they can look human. No more. No, sir. I'm going to talk. And there's a little woman by the name of, what's her name? Oh, well, there's a Sheila Graham. The ex-girlfriend of a very good writer, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who unfortunately died 30 years ago. 
and she's been using him and everybody else. She's a fat, red-headed English idiot, but she gets paid. Now, I'm going to get paid, or they're going to get paid off. But to get back to Sid Loft, let's just concentrate on him. Let's expose him. This isn't a court trial, a court case anymore over the children. This is a vendetta. My personal vendetta to, for what he's done to the children, to Joey and Lorna. He can't. He's incapable. He is incapable of ever getting their respect or their love because he hasn't given them either one. They don't like him. I don't blame them. He smells. He's got every racetrack book here, or whatever you call it, wh whoever he's cheated in every part of the world. They're after him, but they, you know, they come to me first because they know he hasn't got a cent because he doesn't work, but he gambles. So they come to me. I won't pay him. I don't gamble. Let him get out and let them shoot at him or kill him or make him work. Not for my children. Who needs him? He's a drunk and a derelict. Take a look at his face. You ought to hear him talk to the press someday. You ought to go through what I've gone through, sitting in court, and hear him lie, and hear the judge say, yes, and the lawyers say, yes. After all, he's the father of these children. What the hell has he ever done? I'll tell you what he's done. Because I know all about him. And I'm the only one who can tell it. And I'm the only one who will be heard. I'm not afraid of him. I hate his guts. And my children can read this too because they hate his guts. What about his mother? Oh, boy. What a sticky, stinking bunch to be caught up with. But they caught me up because I made money. But he made me sick. Now I'm going to make him sick. I'm going to make him so sick. He's been digging his own grave for a long time. Now he can just put his rotten self into the grave and put the dirt over it. Yeah, this is a rough story, and I sound like a rough woman. I am about Sid Luft. I am about a lot of people. except my son and my two daughters and the man I'm in love with. And I have a right to be in love. And I have a right to be loved. And I have a right to get a divorce from a criminal. 
and to be married properly. I want my son Joey to give me away at my wedding to Mark Heron. Mark Heron wants Joey to be his best man. I want my Lorna, my daughter, to be a bridesmaid. I want Liza to be to stand up with me in a lovely way. And I'm going to wear white. White. White satin. And white lace. And white pearls. Because I am pure. And I'm marrying pure. And my children are pure. So you see, it's not all crazy and insane the way people like to write it. Maybe this will be a news item. I can't believe the people that have worked for me, the publicity men, like Guy McElwain, when I'm smeared and my children have to read the papers and it's agony for them. He says, well, don't pay any attention to it and don't answer it. Don't try to say anything good in defense of yourself because that's not news. I can't believe that. And I won't. Because I know about his life, too. And he's pretty crummy. He got paid a lot. But for a statement like that, that's a pretty stupid press agent. I've been a stupid woman because I wanted to believe in people who I was paying thousands of dollars to. Well, they're going to have to prove themselves right to me before they get a penny or a minute of my time. I've sung. I'll be friendly. I am friendly. I like people to be friendly to me, but for goodness sakes fellas and women. Let's deal the cards right. And while we're talking about dealing cards, why don't all you people who Sid Luft has gambled with and lost, why don't you collect your money? Don't look to me for it. I go out and I work. My mark works. That's to support our children. Our children. Because in the eyes of God, we are a family. And that's more than most legends or anything else can say. Mark has given me courage. Mark has given me love. Mark has given the children love. Mark is so wonderful that it's hard for the rest of mankind to understand him. I understand him. I understand what he's given to me. I understand what he's given to Liza and to Lorna and to Joe. They understand it too. 
He's the only father they've ever had. He's gentle, but by gosh, he's strong. And I love Mark Heron, and Mark Heron loves me. What's so silly about that? What's so crazy? We will be married. We are correct, nice people. I will have more babies. With my husband, Mark, we will have a wedding ceremony. They'll be over the rainbow for me. I've just about got it made. All I have to do is talk, and all you have to do is read or listen, and believe me the way you believed me when I sang all the songs. Well, now I'm talking, and listen to me, for goodness sakes. Don't make a joke of me anymore. People say, and print, and believe the stupid ones and the, mon the minority that I'm either a drunk, a drug addict, or what? It's a goddamn wonder I'm not. But I'm not. Because there's Joe, Lorna, Liza, Mark, and me. And whoever wants to love us is welcome. Whoever is against us, get out. It's very difficult, indeed, to record. Very difficult to record one's thoughts alone. And when I play back the tapes, I hear that I slur my words very badly, but that doesn't make too much difference as long as my thoughts are not slurred. I'd like to talk about my three successful children. They're great successes unto themselves without an awful lot of help. I gave them so-called instant love because I had to work to support them. Nobody else would. And that meant I had to leave them many times. And that meant I had to make them believe in my love when I left them. And that meant that I, they had to know that I would come back. It also had to mean that they had to know that I had a life, that I would be well, and that when they grew up, they could leave me, and that I would be all right then. It's not easy take. Oh no, you think all kinds of things. It's all kinds of modern care unto yourself. You think, oh well, I raise my children. If you're all, all alone and raising children, you do the best you can. Well, I've done a hell of a good job. You take a look at those three children. They're individual, they're beautiful, they're dynamic, they're powerful, they're loving, they're full of sunshine, very seldom full of sadness, and they're outgoing, and they know the score. 
and they're all three very handsome and they all three love me just the way I love them we're four people they're people not children they're children not people whichever way you want to put it I respect them I disciplined because that was the only way I could give them security I objected many times I will not have spoiled children I'm not a spoiled woman spoiled children won't get on well with the rest of the world they're not spoiled but they're smart loving and talented and I'm a terribly terribly lucky woman I've been able to be honest with them and I have enabled them to be honest with me if for nothing else for that I'm proud I think I have every right to write a book I think I'm interesting I have perspective about me I am Gemini the personality most likely to split I never allowed myself a split personality I've never allowed myself to even have too bad a head cold when it came time to go on stage because my parents have been an audience they at least put their hands together and made a sound called applause and a warmth hit me someone said it's been a, an interesting one I think interesting enough finally for me to tell I'm very self-conscious about talking about myself but I think I've got something to write about at last if you like it you'll like it if you don't like it you won't like it but you won't be able to take it lightly any more than I've been able to take it lightly I've laughed at myself when I should have cried and I've cried because I had every reason I got damn mad I'm an angry lady I'm a lady who is angry I've been insulted slandered, humiliated, but still America's sweetheart. Now I'm a rather intelligent, I think, or, and I'm emotional, yeah, I'm a woman, I'm emotional, I'm not something you wind up and put on a stage that sings Carnegie Hall album and you put her in a closet and forget to invite her to the party that's given for her, the ages leave her behind. I'm mad, I am mad enough, and yet still very self-conscious that I'm going to write a book and I'm going to talk because I can do something besides sing, you know. I don't always have to sing a song. There is something besides the man that got away or over the rainbow or the trolley song. There's a woman. There are three children. There's me. There's a lot of life going here. I wanted to believe and I tried my damnedest to believe in the rainbow that I tried to get over and I couldn't so what lots of people can't but I'm not lots of people I'm me, 
I'm the one who's had to live with me. I don't want to hear any resentment from anybody else now about how difficult I am. And I don't want to pick up a paper and read how unfit a mother I am when I have three marvelous children who seem to take and have always loved me. Fat, thin, funny, sad. They think I'm pretty good. I think they're great. I have love and have never planned revenge. However, however this book turns out, it's because of, I am the result of an audience, of a critic, of critics, of what people have made me. And in the meantime, there's been another whole human being, myself, that hasn't been even interesting enough to write good stories in the newspapers that would be printed. They weren't, they're not interested. I, I'm a good cook. I am a good mother. I do believe in going to church. I love music. They were the disbelievers. Now they're going to have to put up with their names being printed. They better not too because I'm only going to write it the truth. But in the meantime, how do I find the true Judy Garland or Francis Garland or whatever? Just a, a girl or a woman. I get angry. I've never been allowed to be angry. I can get angry in front of my son off. I'm supposed to transport the, I don't know. I, I don't know use my, I do get so frustrated. It's very difficult for Irving. It's all well and good for you people, publishers. Now, this is not to be included in my book. For Irving, it's hard to take just take 50 uh, pages and it would be taken off the table. But you can't write how nervous my hands get. Oh, I'll also be able to tell. As I write the book after, I get enough money to take the time to write this marvelous story, you'll find that I'm, there's an awful lot of baggy pants comedy in me. There's a lot of tragedy, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of practicality. The practical thing being that I do know what I'm worth. I'm supposed to do this tape and talk about what the book will be. That's what Irving told me to do. Swifty. Swifty has never had to sit down with a microphone and say what he's going to write. What does he write? In shorthand or talk in, in some kind of Sanskrit? It's very difficult for me, but I'm going to write it for whoever. It's, you're all for grabs now. But I can guarantee you, even if I have to, to form a new publishing company and write this book, it's going to be one hell of a great, everlastingly great book with humor, tears, fun, emotion, and love. Signing off. The book that I'm going to write has to have a title. It can be called Judy. It can be called So Far So Good, or it can be called And Now, Ladies and Gentlemen, Miss Judy Garland. I beat on the fields. Lowering collusion and partnership. And they took me for a ride. And they owe me money. And that's all I want is money. I want my money. I worked hard. And they used me emotionally. It was emotional blackmail. Even
depending on them. They saw me out. They didn't protect me. They took money from me that belongs to my children and myself, and I want it back. I want it back because I'll expose them. I want they humiliated me. David Beekerman especially. He's a crook. He was crooked with me. So was his wife. So was his partner because he decided to cover up with his partner. Maybe he didn't want to. And, but he couldn't help it because he was weak too and they were both on the verge of being found out by me, just me. I'm not talking about Sid Luft. He's just as bad or worse. But I want my money. That's all. Just my money. And I'll get it. I worked hard. I was never protected in any way, emotionally, financially. Promises that I was given by Beethoven so that I would be financially independent never came true because he gambled away too much. He told me that there was a picture of my trying to commit suicide in England and within 24 hours somebody had to fly over to, well not to, to so he could get the negative. Nobody ever heard of that negative or saw it. And nobody in the English press would dare print a thing like that. Nobody saw it. Then there was, there was all that money that came out of my earnings in Las Vegas for, he, as Bigelman said, for guards and so forth. Yes, I had guards, but I didn't have the amount of money paid out that wasn't necessary. He's a gambler and an inveterate loser, and he used my money to gamble. He used me physically, mentally, emotionally. And so did Freddy. And he was supposed to people that I depended upon. These were the people who loved me so much. That's beside the point. I have no feeling about them emotionally, but I want my money. They'll be exposed otherwise. They'll be put in jail. I don't know what to sit left of the world. I want my money. I want my children to have money. I don't want to have to work. I was told I would never have to work after I did my television shows, my series. I was also then not protected. They didn't even come around. They advised auditors like Charlie Rental and so on. There was no reason for income tax not being 
set aside monies for income tax, federal income tax, in 1962. I was making money. I hate people who have stolen from me. I won't have it anymore. I'm not a child, and I'm not unwise. I prefer to be that way because I couldn't bear the thought that I didn't have friends or protection. But that's not true anymore. I'm big business. I am big business, and they used me. Now they're going to have to pay up. They're going to have to pay me. I started their business. They're very important now. They must be very rich. I'm not. I'm still working. I want that money back. I want lots of money back that they took. I hate them for scaring me. I hate them for not protecting me at CBS, but advising that I resign. Why didn't they? And I sell other people and clients, that's why. They were afraid. So I was a patsy. Well, they they'll pay. They must pay. I'll find ways. I won't sue along with Sid Lott. He's another criminal. But I don't want them handling my daughter. Because they're indecent. Maybe I finally got it wise. It's not easy for me. I wanted to have them as friends. I wanted to protect them. That's more than they did for me. I I didn't want their... and don't want their protection emotionally. I don't want their friendship. Well, I'm not that same nice girl. I'm nicer than all of the criminals put together who have robbed me. But I'm not a fool anymore. And I want my money. I want my money for my children. And I want my children to not have anything to do with Mrs. Dunner, with her ex-husband. Oh, you try to sing that last song, but I never really realized what the words mean, and I wonder how poetry, uh, the poetry of Anna Gershwin, and uh, I beg upon George Gershwin and Paul Hayward, just think of, my mind's gone now. Listening, follow his tired footsteps, climbing up the stairs. Oh, all oh, my sorrows come to keep me company, whispering beside me when I say my prayers. that I'm working. Working with me we're travelers. Joining together to the promised land. The old man saw us marching all the way with me to an in the end, the documentary biography never materialized, leaving behind only the haunting echoes of Garland's final recording a poignant reminder of the pungent sadness and heartbreaking beauty that defined her extraordinary life and legacy. Thank you for joining us on this heartfelt journey through the life, triumphs, and trials of Judy Garland. 
As her legacy lives on, may we continue to find inspiration in the stories of those who have graced the stage and screen, reminding us that in the end, it is the human spirit that shines the brightest. Thank you guys for embarking on this immersive journey through the triumphs and trials of the legendary Judy Garland. In the tapestry of Hollywood's history, her life stands as a testament to the power of talent, resilience, and the indomitable spirit that propels artists forward. We've only but scratched the surface of a career that spanned decades, a career marked by the glitz and glamour of stardom, but also the shadows that often accompany fame. Judy Garland was more than just a star. She was a person, a woman who grappled with the complexities of an industry that both celebrated and challenged her. If you found this exploration enlightening and resonant, I invite you to like, subscribe, and share. And it would also mean the world if you decide to check out my Patreon because it's patrons like you and the viewers of this channel that make creating these documentaries possible because, uh, let's face it, recording a full documentary and editing this and everything all on my own, it takes a hefty, hefty amount of time. So thank you to all of you guys that help support me. May the legacy of Judy Garland continue to inspire, reminding us that within the tales of triumphs and trials, there lies a profound humanity that connects us all. Take care, and see you in the next chapter. Well, if you stuck around this far into the video, you are an absolute real one, so thank you so much. And you're probably a big Judy Garland fan, aren't you? Honestly, these tapes specifically broke my heart to hear. And that's kind of what really illustrates the life that Judy Garland actually lived. But with a little click of the ruby heels, I am off, you guys. So thank you for tuning in. If you want to check out another one of my documentaries, you can check out one here. And thank you to all of my patrons for supporting these videos. It is with your help and with all of the viewers' help that they are possible. And um, I guess that is it for me. Stay sparkly.